Cuckoo's house. Screw them. They can go wherever they want. They don't want us, and we don't want them. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I am your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Ainsworth, here to break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater who came to buy, please be sure to hit subscribe down below. That way, we can lay us in the Cougs into your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Locked On Cougs your first listen of the day. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. That's where you found us. It is so good to see you again. We are over 1,450 subscribers. We're approaching 1,500, and when we get to 1,500, some of you, some one of you is going to get get a hat just like mine. Cougar on the front, Locked On the side, etc. Uh, so make sure you hit subscribe to get us there and like and comment on the videos to let us know you are in the contest. We're also giving away a uh, Houston Cougar jersey with the Big 12 logo or emblem on it. If we get to 2000 for the TCU game, so make sure you are hitting subscribe and commenting on the videos. If after listening to talking about what Dana has to say and then briefly talking about the UTSA defense, because I got to get through those notes that I have, you have nothing left to mention. You want to talk about volleyball or basketball or what have you, or you're just a little dumbfounded at how anyone could argue with what Dana had to say. Tell us in the comments down below if a muffin is just a naked cupcake. All right, so. The quote I led off with, we're going to go more in detail in a second, but the first segment, we're talking about things that Dana said uh, specifically in tying to that quote in his radio show on Tuesday night. The second segment is going to be diving in more between his radio show on Tuesday night, kind of other stuff he had to say tied into his media availability on Monday, kind of reading between the lines, kind of segment, saying what kind of things we can look forward to this weekend as the football season kicks off and then the final segment yes i did promise on monday that i had those defensive notes on the utsa game a year ago and we'll kind of break down quickly those we got a busy week ahead of us with the football game saturday so we'll get into those at the end but first let's start off with that quote again when asked by a crowd member at a radio show so i should actually back up a step dana holgerson is renewing his radio show every week every tuesday night they go to little woodrow's and frankly, Little Woodrow's, you can, A, it's an NIL sponsor for the Cougs, so you can go support the Cougs. And after a couple of statements with Dana Holgerson, he talks to Jeremy Brennan, who's been on the show before. Um, and Dana will then take questions from the crowd or online. They kind of go back and forth. And it was asked of Dana, what does he think about entering the Big 12? And this was, admittedly, I'm listening to the, the audio of it, but it sounded like an older gentleman. And the guy said, you know, Part of the excitement he thought in joining a big conference, sounds like from his era, would have been in playing Texas and Texas A&M more frequently or just at all. And, you know, admittedly, that's the Southwest Conference rivalries you kind of want to drum up. And as the guy pointed out, those schools are in the SEC or very quickly about to be in the SEC. And so we kind of missed out on those. I think there's a couple ways to take that question, and I'm really glad that Dana didn't take it the way that I think the guy wanted it to be t- taken, and that would be like, I, we're going to move into the SEC at some point or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Like, do I think Houston can become an SEC caliber program? Absolutely. Um, and frankly, I don't think it'll take a whole lot of crazy imagination to get there. That's a separate episode for a separate time. Let's go win the Big 12 first. But what I think is interesting is the way Dana actually – answered it so let's go through the whole quote he said i think we the big 12 will be in the same conversation with them the sec you're gonna have that opinion of texas and texas and m wishing we got to play them more often if you want to but they're the reasons why we weren't in the big 12 i mean those two are specific reasons why we haven't been in the big 12 for the last 28 years so screw them they can go where they want you know i'm just telling you you're entitled to your opinion on those two schools all you want but they don't want us and we don't want them so move on. He would go on to like pacify it a little bit as the thing went on. Uh, and we'll continue to talk about how the Big 12 Conference as a whole, top to bottom, is good. He's mentioned several times at this point in the last media cycle, the last six months or so, that there is no layup in the Big 12 anymore. Even Kansas and Jalen Daniels are very talented, right? Um, but I love, I love, love, even if it becomes bulletin board for Sark or Jimbo or whomever, I love this passion energy because, frankly, We get a lot of candid Dana Holgerson all the time. We get a lot of, you know, quotable kind of like quips from Dana Holgerson. He's the Red Bull guy. He's the fun. Like, I like a lot of things about Dana and these things that I don't know that everybody does. 
And frankly, Dana, I only had a couple problems with Dana in the time that he's been Houston Cougar head coach. Um, as far as like things I did or didn't like, I should say. I mean, he seems like very. I'm not knowing problems with him personally, but um, but I love this energy because, frankly, for a guy that spent a little bit of time in the early 2000s or in the I guess 2008 9, um, that era of Houston Cougar football, and then has now been back here. He strikes a chord that, you know, my family and I would strike would understand very much about the University of Houston. That is that Houston wasn't like just unlucky in getting left out of the Big 12. And Houston wasn't like determined, you know, predetermined or destined to never be in the Big 12. Those are not things that happened in the mid-90s. It was calculated. Now, he mentioned Texas and Texas AM. As a historian, I might also throw in Baylor and Ann Richards, but I digress. The, it was an intentional act. The schools in the original Big 12 did not want city schools, Houston and SMU, and at the time, TCU, um, specifically to this show and us and you and I, Houston, right? They did not want those schools in the Big 12 because that was where those other Big 12 schools at the time went after recruiting kids. And if you go back to the mid-90s and what drove the dollars, Having the best football teams drove the dollars, and having the best football teams meant that you had to go get the kids. It wasn't the same cal brand counting caliber game. The national market audience in the mid '90s when they're doing this is not the same thing as it is in the even five years later by 2000, right? And so, in looking at those things, right, um, leaving out Houston as a school and city was more than intentional. It was calculated, right? It was if. We keep them suppressed. We can come in as a power five program and scoop those kids. Right. Um, now other things happened. Other things unfolded. The Texas brand blew up. The AM brand blew up. The Oklahoma brand blew up. Da, 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 right. They made a bunch of money. Longhorn network came. It's gone. Whatever. Bye. Right. But Dana Holgerson strikes that chord with this quote. And I love that. It's not just because it's at Woodrow's with a bunch of fans. He said this kind of stuff last spring. He said this kind of stuff at media days. He keeps hinting like he understands the assignment. He gets what is asked. He understands where the fan base, the city, the school come from. For a kid from Iowa that wanted to play D3 football for Mike Leach, right? This is impeccable because, frankly, it means – for all the things you want to throw at Dana, all the faults you want to have in Dana, and all the things you might not like about him. Again, do I have times I might call something different offense? Sure. Did I take particular issue with when he said last year that the, you know, leading all of NCAA football and penalties, what he didn't want to take ownership for that? I wish I'd handle, he'd handle that differently, and he and I can disagree on that, whatever, right? I think he does them things very well, calls offense, like gets guys open, makes you know, good pass plays, et cetera. Good pass game coordinator. I think there's 120 schools in America that want him to come in and revamp their passing offense. I will say, I don't know of any Houston Cougar fan that cannot hear that answer and not be enthused by the direction Dana wants to take this thing. And I'll read that one more time. I think we, the Big 12, will be in the same conversation with them, the SEC. You can have the opinion of Texas and Texas A&M if you want but they're the reasons we weren't in the Big 12. I mean, those are the specific reasons why we haven't been in the Big 12 for the last 28 years. So screw them. They can go where they want. You know, I'm just telling you, you're entitled to your opinion on those two schools all you want. But they don't want us and we don't want them. So move on. Because here's the deal. The ultimate way to get back at those two schools, and this is where I'll end this segment, the ultimate way to get back at those two schools is not by beating them the one year we play them this year in football. It's not by eventually becoming an SEC caliber program and moving in or whatever. It's by being the biggest brand Houston can be because, frankly, and I'll reiterate this, when it comes to football, it is not so crazy to think that the city of Houston and the university thus of Houston could very quickly become a much, much bigger brand than College Station or Austin. If you don't think I'm being honest about that, Look at the best players to come through those programs. He, Texas has won one national title since integrating their roster. One. Who was the quarterback? Oh, yeah. Houston's own. Right. I don't think it's that crazy to think that had the Big 12 taken Houston in 1995, that kid never gets to Texas because that kid had never gone to Texas before. And why would he go to Texas after? the Big 12 money. It's not a crazy thing to go down. That's a later episode, I promise. Lots more to get into on things Dana has said in the last 40 hours. Um, I just really, really like the quote one to run with this second. Uh, it, it riled me up a little bit, if you can't tell. 
But first, we got to talk about our buddies at GameTime.co. Now, forget planning ahead and getting it. It is crunching time for Houston Cougar football tickets. The games are this Saturday. And if you are like me and a little bit of a procrastinator, GameTime.co is the perfect place for you because you can forget about planning months in advance. GameTime has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. So guys like me can get a deal for waiting up to the time of the event, get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy theater, and more game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time, will credit you 110% of the difference. 110 get images of your seat before you buy. So you know exactly what to expect when you arrive Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're all set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through email. Snag the tickets without the stress at game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, so I got right up about that one thing Dana said, but Dana has said a number of things in the last two days, both this radio show and at media availability, that I think are intriguing, and I think there are things to read between the lines. I think the most prominent of which is at two different times, once in the radio show in response to a question, and once in media days when asked a question by a reporter. The question, I guess you should say, both questions were about what's his involvement, who's going to end up calling the plays. People are are you know questioning how this is going to work. You have a run game coordinator, a quarterback coach, and an offensive-minded head coach. And those are kind of the three-headed dragon. And in both the radio show and the media availability, Holgerson went down a laundry list of other assistants and, and analysts and things like that on the staff that can help out with this decision and are always in the room. But he said several things that lead me to think that while Iman Yagavi will become the guy, and may become that kind of a football mind. As a run game coordinator, that is his job. When Dana says, hey, it's fourth and two, I need a run, or hey, it's third and four, I need a run, eh, he probably won't run third, but you you got me, right? That's when Iman's got to be ready. Or if it's first and ten, we got to run to keep him on it. That's when Iman's got to be ready. The more he talks about it, and frankly, when asked directly, but who's going to have veto power, Dana said me the more it sounds like Dana is going to be the one running this offense. And I cannot stress enough that the more you pay attention to the times Dana has run the offense, it has been nationally relevant in terms of statistics, right? And 2021, they lose to Texas tech and it all intents and purposes, all the behind door, all the rumor mills, the message, everything sounds like Dana got told, listen, you got to pick this stuff up real fast. And so he started calling the offense then. Look at what happened the rest of 2021 as they go on to be 12 and two and win the Iron Bowl or when it's <laughs> win the Iron Bowl when the Birmingham Bowl against Auburn. I'm thinking Auburn. I did it right. Um, obviously, quick turnaround, very very fast. Then last season, mysteriously, in the second half of the Memphis game, the offense just started looking different, and then the offense for the rest of the season put up offense put up great numbers for the rest of the season with exception the frozen tundra in louisiana right and the bowl game when it was super deluxe freezing cold yeah okay you remember what i'm talking about now every other game they put up crazy good numbers right and sent a quarterback to the pros in the fifth round and a receiver to the pros in the third round dana holgerson again for the same kind of reports was taking over the offense in the second half of the memphis game and never let it go so yes did houston lose shannon dawson in the offseason last year in miami sure Is anyone on campus that upset? Yeah, that silence is because no one's that upset, right? It sounds more and more like Dana's going to have the reins of this offense for the start, and it feels like Nyagavi's learning things, but it feels like, I should say, this is not reporting, this is reading between the lines. Feels like Nyagavi's learning ways to run a passing offense, to tag onto the great run schemes he's been a part of, and ultimately may become that guy. Right, because Dana has mentioned in the past that when he was the offensive coordinator and head coach, it was like it, it killed him. It was like so little sleep and so much stress and so much work, like that it's just too many has to be juggling all things at once and do them all well, but he wants to do them all well, etc. He may be somewhat grooming Nagabi to be that guy. He always talks about the pedigree of Nagabi from coaching perspective, his fast his fast rise to the coaching ranks, how well he did at each stop, the fact that he's married 
to the Katie Head football coach's daughter and the legacy that that has or whatever ties that, right? Like those kinds of things make me think he's grooming you, Gabby, but it's not going to quite be there yet. It's still going to be Dana. The other thing I thought was interesting in um, both the media availability and several times in the radio show is Dana has stressed that it is his job as a football coach, to put a strong product on the field. He said those words verbatim to the media on Monday, right? That is that is his line, his MO, his job to put the product on the field. But he has not been shy that it is our job, you, me, the folks around town, the folks around campus, the folks coming into town from out of town for games to make sure that the atmosphere is Power Five-like. And the radio show, he said at several different points and included that like every Big 12 stadium they play at and his experience having coached in the Big 12 will be sold out. Even Kansas in their modern era of football with Jalen Daniels playing quarterback will have sold out crowds for Big 12 football games. That means Houston needs to step up to the plate and do the same. And it's not enough just to have the tickets bought. It's also about the experience. He even talked at one point about how that impacts recruiting. That we have recruits on campus to come to games. If they're going to be comparing Power 5 experiences amongst a bunch of Power 5 schools and they show up to a lackluster or low energy crowd, you know, they're going to be comparing that to the Red River Shootout. They're going to be comparing that to Baton Rouge. They're going to be comparing that to the Iron Bowl and slipped up and had Freudian slip a second ago, right? Like, they're going to be comparing that to all of those different venues. And honestly, that does come down to everyone else. Now, he's got to put the good product in the field. He continues to say that. I don't mean to dismiss him from doing that. But it raises an interesting question. It raises the question of how much of this first season of the Big 12 sh- does come down to or should fans anticipate just being there, being loud and cheering for the red and white, no matter what's happening. I think he raises a good point, right? Um, he has, after all, done this transition into the Big 12 before once with, with West Virginia. I think he knows a little bit of what he's talking about. Um, roster things to go through. I would All I would point out between the, and this would be the last reading between the lines bit I pull, um, but between the radio show and the media availability, what I will say, right, is that he is very, very clear that the current depth chart, the one we broke down in yesterday's episode, the 2 deep depth chart, is currently their depth chart, but very fluid. That means to say, that is to say that like guys will come in and out of that second team or move from the second team to the first team, et cetera, a lot throughout the season. He also said that like, you know, who dresses the, the, the 70 guys that get to board the plane for travel games or who, uh, all the different, I guess, board the plane when they fly. They only fly a couple times this year. Um, but all of those guys will also be fluid. He was in like, you know, in the running back room, he put Tony Mathis as the starter. But through competition this week, if, you know, Brandon Campbell ended up winning the job, Brandon Campbell, who went on the two beep, might start this Saturday, right? Like he's still having guys compete and fight for spots week in week out. Now, some people feel like, no, there needs to be some set this, some set that, but I do appreciate a, the honesty that Dana comes with in that and B the kind of practice that leads to prepares you to compete better and harder in games. I appreciate that. The last thing on the, on the death chart, he also said is that, you know, they had this luxury of so many talented receivers and so much experience at receiver when like Josh Cobbs comes in as a veteran guy or Boogie Johnson comes in having played power five, big 12 football before that, you know, you don't have to rush the freshman out there at receiver because there's so many talented freshman receivers on this roster right now. You don't have to rush them out there before they're ready. That makes me feel like, a, Jonah and Mikhail Harrison Pilot both got shouted by name, so like they might be the two. But B, that there really is a chance those guys might get redshirted just because at some point you're going to look at like a diminishing returns thing. Do we do we burn their redshirt year for six games or do we continue to let them develop, grow, get bigger, faster, stronger, learn the offense, and then come back and play with Donnie Smith the next year in a, you know, bigger stronger faster body still technically as a freshman with a bunch of time to play left like i could see how that could shift things in the third segment i mentioned on monday i had some notes on the utsa defense and what last games tells us about that so let's let's just jump on it i i, I wanted to get to these because i did go back and rewatch every snap of last year's football game and i think it's important to understand that, like the coordinators in the games um 
assuming Dane is involved in the offense for Houston are the same. Right. Um, and so like some of these things, some of these things will work out where you'll see some of the same kind of schematic things, even if the personnel are different. Now, Frank Harris, a crazy good story on him and Dave Campbell's Texas football thing. I'll read it about like the trials and tribulations he had in the off season, how he almost got told he couldn't medically play football anymore and so on. Um, but he is a baller. That dude's a really, really talented dual threat quarterback. And Houston's going to have to get after him with speed. What Houston had some success with last year was speed at the edges. And what I'm super excited about, yes, we lost Derek Parrish. And yes, he had a crucial play last season where he collapsed the pocket and had a sack that forced interception that Nelson Caesar had that set up a touchdown, right? I'm not saying that you can replace Derek Parrish very easily. And frankly, David Gwegbu is a very different football player however the one thing they have in common is that those two dudes have the highest motor of all 22 players in the field at all times right i really like what i've seen out of a guegbu in the clips we get from practices and then i also really like what i'm seeing out of him and i watch the OU games and stuff like that even though he's pass rushing as a linebacker um him and brian early is me a match made in heaven and i like the idea of him being the guy forcing that backside pressure on Frank Harris, the quarterback. I have to say that obviously Nelson sees being a year older is a nice thing. And for whatever you think about, you know, Houston admittedly has undersized defensive tackles. They do, they do, they do. UTSA will be the most competitive game that that does not show up as big a deal. in, right. Um, like I think they'll smoke rice. I'll think they'll smoke Sam Houston. Maybe he'll prove me wrong and I'll be disappointed, but UTSA is going to be a competitive football game. And unlike the other competitive football games I've seen in Houston schedule, it is not a game where it's going to be necessarily outsized in the same way on the front lines as they will be against some of the other guys. I still think I'm taking dot right on it saying I'm not. I just think that this is a game where like it'll be competitive and you won't see just this massive size disparity. Um, I'll be interested to see how Halsey plays the free safety spot against these guys. Um, now, again, I think it, there's one school of thought that they're going with. It looks like to have your surest defensive back tackler at the free safety spot in this 4-2-5 defense. That might not be what I would do, but that doesn't mean it's not a strategic move that others would do. Um, and I'm looking at the, this defense, looking at what UTSA did last year. Um, I thought they hit the sidelines better last year, um, admittedly, than the free safety kind of spots over the middle of the field. Um but to be fair, right, Halsey, they have great talented corners out there, Fleming and uh, Hogan and so on. And so maybe that's the thought is that those corners can help funnel stuff back into Halsey. We shall see. Um, as far as schematics go from last season, it looks like there were a couple different times last year where Houston had, um, we'll just call them first game mistakes, falling off of tackles and, um, missing you know adjustments or not quite being lined up for tempo and those kinds of things in the first half of that football game for what it's worth once houston got their head screwed on straight schematically they had a spy on harris and they were kind of ready for things to roll around i'm not gonna get to coverage stuff too much because that's kind of receiver dependent um but they made some adjustments at halftime and until the overtime period when they lined up at the 25 um UTSA didn't score after midway through the third quarter, right? So something clicked. They got it figured out. Now, a couple of things I think are important to know about that. The thing that got them in the first half, as I mentioned, was there were times where UTSA ran tempo and Houston was not quite lined up right. It's going to be hot as all get out on Saturday. UTSA does not has, you know, I guess they've been practicing out, outside in San Antonio, um, but if you've you know, been following the weather and stuff like that, there have been a lot of uh, schools that have had to adjust their football practices if they're only practicing outside because of how ridiculous this heat wave has been. Someone should look into that. Um, I, I have to say that I think, I don't think it's smart for them to go tempo for their own sake. They don't have the depth to go tempo and have a bunch of guys cramp up. And I, frankly, again, this is going to be one of the few games where I would feel like Houston actually had the depth advantage if it becomes a longevity battle in the heat because UTSA wants to run tempo, right? So I don't think they're going to quite do that. I also think that Houston, in having Doug Belk's scheme versus Frank Harris mm -hmm. on tape from last year, they will be prepared for the dual threat that is Harris. Now, 
I will say that after his summer of injuries, he might be a different guy, different athlete, might be more of a pocket guy and change their offense and we have to adjust. But if he comes out of the same dual threat kind of guy, Belk can put on the has been able to put on the tape for the last month and pull up like here's what we were successful with in the later third and fourth quarters against that, right? He has that information and can do that. I also think for what it's worth, um, them like Robinson, like I think they've got the right guys in the depth chart as well to get after it and track him. Um, you know, I think hip will play. So the big deal in the yesterday show is that hip light is not currently as a starting linebacker. We'll see how that goes. Um, I think he will play some, and I think hip as a strong safety moved into linebacker that can then track Frank here. I think that'll be a really, really good move for him and the Cougs. Um, not that it's a one person job ever. And frankly, depending on the field position, I guess that might be a different guy's job, but you feel me on that a little bit. Um, if anything, so we got to overtime last year and the touchdown they had, right, that UTSA had in and of itself was a broken play on a missed tackle in which Harris ended up uh, kind of scrambling around and finding a touchdown. Um, and then, you know, I think UTSA is sitting there biting their lips because they feel like they should have scored in the third overtime because you sent a guy fall down in coverage and they missed the open guy. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but on the whole, if we watch the course of that game, Houston had found ways to stop UTSA by getting pressure on the quarterback and having what I'd call a crush. So pressure the quarterback from the edges, but then the middle, the defensive tackles, the linebacker, we would call it a crush rush, meaning you just like rush for two or three steps and then are sitting there holding the gap. So no one can run past you in that gap, but you're not necessarily like pursuing and pressure. Then the edge guys use their speed to do that and almost flush him up to you, right? There was a missed tackle in the second overtime, but on the whole, that very clearly worked very well for Houston in the latter third and fourth quarters. Um, UTSA looked frustrated, right? Because it's also what I would do against Russell Wilson, anybody else that's good on their feet and good getting out of the pocket. Um, but it looked like they weren't quite ready for what does our offense look like when we're not moving that pocket or we're not kind of improvising, playing a little if this, then that kind of stuff. Um, other... Hmm, other things I'd point out is that, like, in watching that game from last year, like, we kind of forget how good Alex Hogan is at corner. Alex Hogan's a really good corner, folks. I know that he got hurt early in the season last year, and so it's kind of hard to remember because we also got gave up 77 to SMU when he wasn't on the field or whatever. But I'm telling you, Alex Hogan is really, really good. So remember that kind of stuff as we watch this game. Like, Fleming is really, really good. So remember that kind of stuff when we watch this game, right? Um, my last defensive note, is I mentioned the tempo thing being a first game kind of thing. The other thing UTSA that got Houston did that got Houston in a first game kind of way was they played with the snap count and the hard count and those kind of things. That comes back to, and this isn't quite full circle because it was in the second segment, but when we talk about creating a home field environment for Houston that feels Power Five like, and we talk about that they've sold over 35,000 tickets to TDECU Stadium for this weekend's football game. All of those false starts are, are not false starts because on defense. So jumping off sides or, you know, encroachment kind of penalties that Houston had in the Alamo Dome last year. Houston needs to make sure they return the favor this year. Um, they, A, should be so crazy allowing UTSA is on offense that they can't audible. They can't get the snap count off themselves. We should create false starts as a crowd. Yes, we should. Um, we also, for what it's worth, as the Houston Cougars on defense should kind of have the benefit of the home crowd. Um, and so like, you know, I, I would hope that that would work in our favor, both emotionally and like logistically, like where we're not jumping or, and those kinds of things, because we're creating more chaos for them than we are for ourselves. Um, digression, right? That is to say that it'll be loud when UTSA is an offense as opposed to a hard count warranting working because they're gonna have to go to a silent count, right? You can't go to a hard count if it's that loud when you're on offense. Anyway, I've talked too long tomorrow in locked on Cougs. We're gonna talk to some people that look at UTSA all day, every day as well. Uh, there is no locked on UTSA. We're gonna bring on a podcast or a couple of podcast folks to talk about the UTSA uh, side of things. And then on Friday, I'll get my final thoughts. I am excited, excited, excited folks. Locked on Cougs. 
Thank you so much for making us your number one podcast of the day. If you're looking for a second podcast of the day, I'm going to recommend Locked On Big 12 as we're entering the Big 12. It's Big 12 football season's coming up. Make sure you go check out what Drake Toll's got going on over there. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Locked On Cougs, Locked On Cougs, Prime Locked On Podcast Network. That means your team every day. Go Cougs.